Um, in terms of why I'm here, um, there could be several reasons. I got the invite and you know, I thought it might be because I'm an alum, but my address that they had in the computer was my address from my last apartment at UT, so they haven't been keeping up with me. <laughs> but now I'm going to get all that alumni or mail asking me for my money. Um, it could be for, I do uh, hydrogeophysics and I'm trying to get the environmental consulting community to adopt the same techniques the oil industry and the medical industry does in that prior to an operation you scan the patient and then you go invasive. The environmental industry, you got contaminants, we just start poking. Um, so trying to evolve that industry to that approach. Um, but I, I figured the reason I was invited was because I um, was dumb enough to talk about seismic activity in our state. Um, I ride earthquakes several times a day. Um, I was up, to, uh, we've increased seismicity about 600%. Um, and so every single day we have earthquakes, uh, which is quite interesting. And I bought a house on the intersection of two faults that both move, um, including right underneath my house. So didn't know that at the time. <laughs> but what happened was um, in giving talks about that, um, other people couldn't say things. And in terms of why you're here, um, I learned a few lessons about communicating with the public about these things and some of the problems Jay talked about. And so I'm going to show you some of that. Um, if we look at the picture here in terms of thinking about water, I'm going to talk about your instincts for water and the public's instincts for water. And one concept of science is that our job is to collect data to figure out where we're stupid. And that we have instincts. And you go, hey, and you, Kanye West, I think it was, he says, I'm going to run for president in four years. That's a bad instinct. <laughs> and science's job is to provide data to show you why it's a bad instinct and line up your instincts with the data. For water, our instincts are really, really, really terrible. Um, and the problem is you guys are water scientists and you were born with the same set of instincts and you were raised playing in a swimming pool the way the other kids were, you only became really disturbed and altered as you got science degrees. So <laughs> your instincts are still built in and it's hard to break them, but communicating to the public, it's even worse. So when you look at a nice lake like this in Iraq and you look at the pretty sunset, um, you have a set of feelings associated with that and you can use things in your slides that will evoke feelings and alter the public's concept. But one concept that's quite useful is that when you are given these talks that you are roughly equivalent to a monk um, and you can provide options to people but you're conveying data and they could be doing the stupidest thing in the world from your viewpoint but you're going to convey the data and I ended up with a whole set of rules that's similar to the detective on NCIS where you have rules of how you deal with police things there's rules for dealing with the public in the context that you should be on one of the teams and if you are not going to be on one of the teams, you have to let the people know right before you talk. Not somewhere in the middle. By the way, I said that, and you think that's for your team, but I'm not on your team. That just says, hey, I don't like you or something. At the very beginning, I told everybody, look, I'm neutral. And if I am sliding one way or the other on any of these topics, you let me know. And you can tell me afterwards, and I'll get these corrected because I give these talks regularly. But let me know, and I'll slide back into neutral. I did get accused of being overly neutral. <laughs> So. You can be more in the middle and too much. Um, and I also had somebody say, you know, I think this situation would be better if you weren't neutral. And I said, well, there's lots of people on the teams, but hanging out in the middle is actually quite a useful place to be. So we'll look at this lake again in a bit, uh, but thinking about neutrality is part of it. Um, I'm so neutral that I managed to get the legal department of OSU to give me a legal disclaimer slide. <laughs> Because the president of the university is getting phone calls about a professor in the School of Geology, um, I have the ability as a tenured professor to not be beholden to my agency. Although my agency put out a legal disclaimer that says, he works here, but he's not talking for us. Um, and that's a useful thing to say, probably help them out. Um, I was asked to be fired at her. And, and the president of the university, and the rumor I've heard is that he said, look, He's talking about peer-reviewed research from a neutral perspective. If I fire him, your life will get a whole lot worse. Um, trust me, academics watch this kind of stuff. But um, you get these sorts of things that say, um, he's a nice guy, but we're 
just let us know if it's an issue. <laughs> uh, so we're going to talk about your instincts, uh, teach you how to be an evil water scientist, and then we'll do two case studies, one in Iraq and one in Australia. Um, and I use, I use glasses of water and I use water bottles um, for examples to people. And for people that you talk about groundwater, they drink it every day. They go to McDonald's, they get themselves a nice 40 ounce glass of rocks and somebody puts sugar water in it. Um, and they think about that as a glass of soda, but the, the rocks are clear. And so they don't understand, they just put a well into a groundwater system of porous media and drink out of it. And got ripped off because 40%, 60% of the space was taken up by rocks. Um, and I, I guess somebody sued um, a coffee place this oh, year because they put ice in there and you realize the volume's much reduced and it's like, yeah, that's why they do it. <laughs> but it really helps the public think about, oh yeah, there is stuff in there and I can get a lot out of there. Um, uh, but in terms of thinking about that, your instincts, you might be thinking about the glass your guy, your guy that has to wash it or something. You might think it's a glass of water, you might think it's a glass of ice, you might be thinking about the air in there. Um, but whatever you're thinking, I can't control. Because your instincts, it doesn't matter in how much reason's involved, you just have a sense. And it's post-lunch and you're sleepy, your instincts are fully kicked in versus any rational thought. So um, when you talk to the public, you can't tell them what to think about that picture. You can make it blue so it feels friendlier. Um, if you want to make it more upset, you can make a Red picture, really more excited. Jay's one that. Um, instincts. Quick example: Which profession adds the most to human life? Who gets all the funding? NIH, because doctors are out there saving humans. Out of human life expectancy, water scientists are most of it. And in terms of changes, if you're over 34, water scientists are probably the reason why that happened. But we take no credit for that, and we have near, no, nowhere near the funding of the health guys. But fundamentally, it's our fault that people are alive. So if you got somebody old and cranky, realize you caused that. Um, but you should also take credit for it. So with instincts, there's a guy who wrote a book about how we're actually quite predictable in terms of our not being rational. And guys that sell you cars and people that sell you anything actually work on your brain and work on your rational parts. He figured this out when he was a kid, he was badly burned, and they kept pulling off of his, his um, dressings and stuff and redressing him. And it's, it's incredibly painful to pull those off and redo them every day. He found out many, many years later, there was absolutely no study that said that's a good idea or helps. It's just incredibly painful. But they decided this was what you're supposed to do, and so they did it to him every day and basically tortured him as a kid. Um, so he went into studying that stuff, and he studies why you decide I should pay $42,000 on this car. And it turns out there's very, very little rational about it. So in terms of water stuff, um, here's some things to, that we could talk about instinct on it. You guys are um, water managers of some sort, some aspect of it. And we have no evidence that we're improving management. If you are financial managers, your client always loses. Their long-term investments that you've said, I, I need to have water for my retirement, you've always lost for your clients. You should be fired. <laughs> but it's built on instincts. Your instincts are, we're, we're managing water. We're doing things. We, we watch that spigot. We're doing stuff. I'll show you we're really not. Um, groundwater research is just starting, we just got the tools, and that's a whole other talk to talk about that, but we haven't actually had the tools, and there's people writing journal articles explaining how we're at the end of research for groundwater. <laughs> Stop writing grants and give us the money, because there's a lot more stuff that we know how to do. Um, and then conflict, um, you tend to want to avoid conflict. As scientists, we're not people that, you know, if you said, what's a good time? And you talk to a political scientist, you say, oh, I want to go fight Donald Trump on stage or something, and, and really get into war words, and that. That's what I'm, most scientists that go, yeah, I don't want to do that. I'll go sit on the lake and take a, take a temperature measure. That's my idea of a good time. So as people, we're not really built for that, but if you want to improve water resources, conflict is really good. Generating conflict is not so good, but having conflict is actually quite good. So in terms of instincts, I'm going to give you a water supply, a nice surface water supply. 
A little chunk of concrete we'll put in, we'll do some piping, we'll throw in a little generator, put in a boat dock for you, it'd be really nice. If you're a congressman and you've got a few people that aren't your wife that's going to go out with you, you can take them out there on the boat. Just don't tell them Gary Hart sent you. Um, all these sorts of wonderful things we're going to give you. We'll give you flood control and water supply at the same time, although they're antithetical scientifically. Um, and they sold lots of these things. And people were sold on all sorts of components of what they're going to get. But how much should you spend? And put a number in your head. Don't tell me what the number is. And my guess is the number is somewhere in the multiple billions, hundreds of billions, maybe, or multiple millions, hundreds of millions, maybe billions. Okay. Um, so, and what are you investing in? What are you really buying? What, are you, what, are you, what am I selling you? And when they built a lot of these chunks of concrete, they, they had things they were selling you. The groundwater guys are terrible at this. You're buying the same thing in the case of water supply. We need storage. Okay, well, you need storage in a space to put your water. Well, hey, this is attractive. <laughs> you know, I'm going to show your constituents that they elected you to office and they gave you that for a low, low price of $10 million or $100 million. If you went in and said, I spent a billion dollars on that, you're not getting reelected. So you got to think about how our stuff looks and selling groundwater supply or talking about groundwater supply is terrible video, it's terrible slides. I did a groundwater work, we did a piece in Australia and they brought out the camera crew and we, we actually we did a mobile gas sample and sealed off a vial and they took pictures of the flame reflecting in the goggles, we wore safety goggles. And they're wrapping up the camera equipment and we went to take a water level at the end, and sent down our water level meter and went and beat. The reporter jumped up, get that equipment out of here, they got something that goes beep. Because <laughs> we were giving them nothing. <laughs> we had six of these and nothing else. So you've got to think about that for conveying this information that you're asking them to spend money, their instinct is uh, the previous page is worth a lot more than this page, although they're just buying storage. But if you put it to the numbers and say, how much does your storage cost? Um, surface water storage is about a billion dollars per cubic kilometer worth of space. Groundwater is about a hundred thousand. When you say, I want to do a groundwater project, I know very few groundwater folks that are the cojones to tell them I'm going to spend a hundred million dollars on this groundwater project. But an engineer will say, I'll, I'll put a block of concrete in your river, I'll do that for a billion. And you go, oh, wait, are we just selling storage? Um, and there's a lot of complexity to that. I've actually watched projects where they were going to compare the two, and the groundwater was the obvious better option based on numbers, and they sold them a pipeline, a very expensive pipeline. And you go, are we buying storage? Are we buying supply? But you can lay out, here's the differences. And so very, very commonly, we lay out surface water, because that's a different agency, and we lay out groundwater. And we don't lay all the different storage options together. And putting them together is quite useful. The other thing I talk about is, if you look at water bottles, because people typically have them when you're giving talks, um, the surface water is the cap, and that's what we've been managing for a long time. The majority of the water is sitting in the ground in the bottle. Okay? About 98.5% of storage is groundwater. So if you're going to look at that as an example, um, we spend all the money up here where we can see things, because that's what people do. They, they need to see water. Your best example of that is to go to Las Vegas. <laughs> Go up to some place very, very wet, go to Ireland or something, you go to a nice hotel, there's no fountain. It's because it rains. If you go to Vegas, there's no water, there's a fountain in front of the hotels. to let you know water is there. People want to see water. When they spend water, they'll spend it on the part they see. They won't spend it on storage and rocks under the ground. They don't know what they're getting. Um, and so, but pointing that out, that that's where all the water is at, they don't, they don't get that that's that big of a difference. And so the water bottles are really good for conveying that. Another concept that's quite difficult for people is they think they're using water because that's what we tell them. They go, okay, well, we've measured what you've used and we've sent you a bill because it went through a meter. Well, if, if they just sent it through and put it back in the drain, they didn't use any water in the basin. It's still a liquid. They just paid for it to go through a meter and put it back down the drain. The only way they're going to use it is if they evaporated it. 
But they think about it like a fuel, and if you put gasoline in the tank, you actually change it. You actually break bonds and generate energy. Only thing we do with water is turn it into a vapor. If we were labeled as a species from afar, they didn't want to come chat with us, they just wanted to figure out what we did, we consume carbon in various forms and we evaporate water. That's our basic gig as humans. So people don't realize that that's what they're doing with water. They think they used it. And flushing the toilet, we say, don't flush the toilet, you're using water. Oh, don't water your lawn so much, you're using water. Flushing your toilet, you didn't evaporate a lot. Water your lawn, you did. And so, but we treat it all as use based on the meter instead of what they're doing with it, which is converting it to vapor. And even we as scientists don't talk about water vapor, we talk about what comes through meters. Because we're programmed to that by our instincts. Our instincts are just as bad as everybody else's. So I use things like this to show, here, here's your precipitation coming in. This is a very primitive thing of the water cycle. But we've tried to make this box bigger. We do cloud seeing and various things. And we, you can't make it rain a whole lot more. Um, you can play games, but we've never been all that successful. And there's nice science behind why that's not that great. We can block off the run of the river, except for now we figured out, you know, the ocean was planning on getting that, and there's a lot of critters that wanted that water coming in. But even we, we can turn that off, and we still don't make basins better. But we completely ignore this box. When we talk about the biggest water wasters, look up Google, biggest water wasters in Texas, you get whose meter went off the highest. You don't get, man, this guy evaporated a lot of water. Nobody's upset at the guy that's evaporating a lot. Uh, if you ask the state agencies, which one of the customers in your purview of people that you keep track of evaporates the most water? I don't know, but I know this guy's meter goes the fastest. Well, great, but he didn't use any water until he evaporated. So keep track of those, because that's where ultimately we as humans dispose of our water. And if we're going to improve that case, that box either has to stay the same or not get bigger. But we completely ignore it because it's the part we don't see. And we're very programmed when we think about water to think about the liquid phase. But our disposal of the liquid phase is gas. Here's how much we've disposed of. This is paper from Lenny County County. We've disposed of 1,000 cubic kilometers off the US. <laughs> our goal since about 1900 is to get rid of 1,000 cubic kilometers of water off the continent. And now Jay can watch it in real time. But functionally, our development has been to, hey, our goal, whether we wanted it to be or not, unstated or not, is to dry out the continents as much as possible. Almost all of our development is actually built to evaporate water almost as quickly as we possibly can. And all of our agencies that are in charge of protecting water do not count for that. They count for where it went through meters. Uh, this is up in Kansas, and they've got enough data that um, Don Whittemore and Jim Butler compiled for these four chunks of the Ogallala, actually five chunks of the Ogallala. Here's our investment strategy, and this came out completely blurry, but sorry about that. That's why I color them as well in case they come out blurry. But this is the net change in water level versus how much you used. All the use is somewhere above zero. They're all about 0.4 billion cubic meters per year. Not that much, but all these places where you're having, if you added them up, you might end up at about a billion cubic meters per year. None of these graphs go to zero, and all the red is when you're losing water. So this is our four money market accounts. You can have this one where you always lose money, <laughs> this one where you always lose money, this one two years out of the rest of them you can make money, and this one a couple of years you can make money, but mostly you're going to lose. Come invest with me. Unless we can actually Make that, thus that this is in the middle of the graph where half the years you lose, half the years you gain, or something like that. Unless you can do that, you're not managing water. You're just slowing down how fast it dries out at best. And so unless we acknowledge that, and Jay's having trouble telling California, we're not managing it. We're just drying it out faster or more slowly. We're not doing any management. Um, the only way you do management is you better put water back in there somehow. So, we, if we put water in the ground, you don't have the evaporation tax. It's super cheap for storage relative to how we do it. You can deal with climate variability because the ground doesn't care. Uh, you can do flood control with that. People don't think about that. You can do drought management. Um, here's one that really, really helped, and then we don't do this scientifically, is that 
There's a lot of places you can set up a recharge structure that would be roughly continuous flow on the ground. And you go, well, I don't want to spend the money on the water that way. Put a generator in the middle. Now somebody's making money on the water going on the ground, and you got somebody on the other side fighting to stick it in the ground because that's where he makes money. If you only make money pumping it out, that's what people are going to do. If you get somebody making money putting it in, well, now you've got something else to work with. But we have nobody working on generating electricity with recharge. I chatted with some people, they said, it should be really, really easy. I'm like, okay, but I already have one business that I'm struggling to maintain. I'm not going to start a second one trying to maintain recharge. So, um, so the other thing to do is, uh, when you're dealing with things, as scientists, we want to do processing. So we want to figure out, what are the steps? What's the map look like? What are the steps? You know, if we only take these 400 steps, we'll get the good water. Um, and you try to figure that out, and everybody's got a different idea about it, and that's problematic. But an objective, you can go, we should head that way. And people can decide, yeah, that seems reasonable. And they'll try a hundred different ways to get there, ways that you would never have guessed. But you're working on the objective as opposed to the process. Um, so we have never in our world, as far as I know, moved into a basin where net, we ended up reducing evapotranspiration and increasing the gains in water over time. The only thing we've ever done as a set of organisms is move into a basin and evaporate water and dry it. You have to reduce about transpiration about 3% to flip that. We can't measure about transpiration within 3%, but if we change it by that much, we'd actually flood, base, flood basins over time, which would be pretty interesting and people would go, well, you got too much water now. But what we do is we completely ignore the major component of how it leaves the basin, for the most part. I know that people have studied this stuff, but and a policy basis, nobody keeps track of easy. So, if you want to be an evil water scientist, what you do is rephrase the way people talk about the hydrologic system. Typically, you're asked to answer questions that are phrased in particular ways. I was asked to answer, so can you tell me how the oil and gas industry is not causing earthquakes in Oklahoma? <laughs> People talk about surface water and groundwater because they're used to that framework because that's what they set up legally because it basically says on an instinct basis, water you can see, water you can't see. And that's how we divided it because we're humans and we go with our instincts. You can go, well, you mean that groundwater outcrop? You want me to talk about the groundwater outcrop? Well, no, I'm talking about a river. Yeah, that's where the groundwater came out. What do you want to do with it? Um, and that really messes with people. They don't quite like that. This one got me in a lot of trouble, and it was a question of if you were Dr. Evil and you wanted to drain out the continent as quickly as possible, as cheaply as possible, would you do something different than spreading water out in really thin lakes over really big areas in low humidity zones? Would you do it differently if your desire was to dry it out? And you could call it water storage. First time I used this slide, I didn't realize half the audience were damn engineers. <laughs> Know your audience. They were, they were in Oklahoma because all of our dams were going to reach average of 50 years old. They were ready to come make their money. And the guy was explaining, well, actually, they built some really nice evaporation basins, but what does that do for our water supply? We evaporate in Oklahoma enough water for about 20 million people. We only have 3 million. So our evaporation rate, about six times the amount of water that we actually use. Um, so we call that water supply. Um, but if you ask them, well, what's the difference between that? You didn't say that it's an evaporation basin, you just asked them what would be the difference. If I was going to build an evaporation basin in Oklahoma or Texas, how would I build it any differently if I needed to dispose of water? Um, we had a drought. The boats are sitting on grass. And I pointed out to a bunch of lawyers that we have about four and a half foot of evaporation. We were one of the first lakes that got studied because it's a really good lake for studying evaporation because it's almost built to evaporate water. If you wanted to design a lake to evaporate water scientifically, you'd build Lake Hefner in central Oklahoma. And so we study that because it's actually a lake on a hill. We're creative. Um, so they didn't realize, they'd never thought about the fact that you're losing about 1.4 meters of water into the sky each year. They never even thought about it. So I didn't communicate anything other than, by the way, evaporation happens. Oh. And I got the lawyers all wrote to me and said, 
Do you have a reference for that? <laughs> <laughs> Why, yes. And I sent them references on that lakes evaporate. Um, they wanted to prove it scientifically. So I did. Why? <laughs> but that ground, that red dirt you see, is an aquifer that they wanted to study because from a water perspective, we said, you know, it's important. You guys used to use that as the water supply for the city. We should study that. And they managed to eat 200,000 out for a groundwater modeling study. That did not include any field data collection. They managed to remodel the aquifer. Well, to fix the drought, they have several of these lakes that are drying out. And so they decided if we put in a 29 mile pipeline, now we can connect all the lakes. They're all dry. I know, but we can manage the drought better now. With what? Um, they already spent 67 million, they're about 75% done, and that will ease our drought. And you point these things out to people that are really, really simple. You go, okay, I'm not a genius. I'm pointing out that lakes evaporate. But a lot of guys that decide that 67 million should get spent, they go, we have a drought, we need to do something. Yeah, you do. And that's not a good idea. Um, but you gotta make sure that they know that's not a good idea, or that you've done enough talks from neutral perspectives that they go, hey, is there a better way to do this? And you can go, here's your options. You don't tell them a good one versus a bad one, you say, here's your options. And here's what that'll do. Um, from the monk perspective, that's the only way to go if you want to actually make some progress. This is actually off the website advertising. We generate as much vapor as possible. Um, <laughs> some people call it irrigation. Um, I call it a humidifier. And I use the golf course example. I could use a center of irrigation, but the guys that make the policy are farmers. The guys who make the policy go golfing. <laughs> and so they can then think about that um, in a different context of, oh wow, in Florida, they maintain a million gallons per day pumping rate on golf courses while they told the old folks who are in a drought so they stopped taking showers. And having old people that haven't showered is not a good thing <laughs> compared to worrying about a bad transpiration a little bit. Um, Chicago, you got a giant hole in the groundwater system, and the flood waters you send off as quickly as possible. Texas is a very good example of this. Floods, get rid of that water, we got a flood. Drought, we need water. Hey, why don't you store some of the water during the flood? Well, it's a different department. <laughs> yeah, okay, but you might want to catch some of it. Um, in the Midwest US, we have 14,000 flood control structures that catch water so that we can not have a flood. That's a good idea. And then we proceed to evaporate it because it's not hooked up to anything. Those could be 14,000 recharge structures that we've already built. But we don't do that. Um, we did also a study, Chicago started doing this, and uh, we're trying this in Oklahoma, and I entered an uh, architecture contest to look at converting a new development into zero runoff. It's actually design-wise, not that hard. The problem is, architects don't know anything about water. And so they did all sorts of things to make quality or quantity go down and screw up everything. Because they didn't even know the geology of the site of the soil map. And we were the only team that had that. And so it's, it's very, it was very interesting to realize that there's a potential for an entire discipline of hydrogeo architecture where you look at new developments and figure out how to get the water to not run off and get it to recharge. In Chicago, they're doing that and trying to get in the ground, but they got the Makoka to shale. Nobody's told them you gotta get underneath that and recharge the real aquifer, not just get it into the soil a little bit. Um, and there's no active effort for that. So they've got part of the concept, but they don't have the whole concept. So here's Kanye and Ravi. Uh, this was my first PhD student, and I got him because I got a call from Southwest Research. Ron Green called me up and he said, I did a master's with a guy in Arizona back in the 80s. And he said, you know, he's going to die soon because he's sitting in Baghdad with a degree from U.S. universities. He actually had two degrees from U.S. universities, and he's going to be shot fairly soon. Can you find a position for a PhD student? <laughs> well, when you put it like that, I'd love to have him. Um, and I looked upon it as like, hey, I got, I got a Jewish guy in Germany. He'd like to come over. We've got some problems right now with a guy named Hitler. I'll take him. Um, so he became a PhD student. And when his family came over, they were 5% of the Iraqi immigrants that year. Because we only let 136 into the country. But his family of, of six folks and him, um, they got in. And, so I got, his, I got him teaching the cows how to measure here.
And one thing that he did when he was in Iraq was he was a thief. And he stole water from he stole water data from Saddam. The water ministry is really hesitant about you knowing what's going on, but he went home and made copies of his water data through the 80s and 90s. Um, and so we've been publishing his results about what the Euphrates and the Tigris have been doing. Um, but if we put up a plot that's completely politically incorrect and look at Muslim population of countries greater than 20 million versus rain and try to help out the Trump campaign about where you should decide where they should be or not be, if you have large Muslim population, those are actually countries that we're not fighting with in any way. If you have rainfall about 230 millimeters per year, that's a problem. And so all you have to do, and his policy is make the admissions say, does your country receive approximately 230 millimeters of rain per year? Um, but it's basically it's a water issue. Okay? These countries are not going to suddenly become stable. Let me show you why. We have this nice gap project. Okay, so we want to fix southern Turkey's water supply. We built 22 dams. Um, one of them has not gone up yet. The biggest dam has not actually been completed. And this is off of the website, not old website. This project rests, rests upon the philosophy of sustainable human development, which we create an environment in which future generations all benefit and develop. Right up below that gap project are countries of Syria and Iraq. Um, what did you guys do with the water? Well, the USDA helped out, so our government helped out. We built all these dams. And we've increased cotton by a factor of four. That was the grand outcome of our sustainable efforts of spending. And if you go to the water summits, the UN water summits, they tout this as the UN was genius. We managed to fix southern Turkey. And we've increased their economy. We've made the world a better place. And I haven't downloaded these years ago when they figured it out. But if you go into Iraq, You've increased salinity by a factor of four, and you're starting out at about the foot of the water line. You can't drink this stuff now. The Iraqis, did they help out? No. Um, they built Lake Tatar to fix the Euphrates by taking water from Iraq and sticking it into a holding basin, whose evaporation rate is 3 billion cubic meters per year. Remember that example over in Kansas? maybe three times as much as Kansas is using in Western Kansas for ag. They're evaporating that much. That's the entire domestic use of the country of Iraq. So you can't blame for it. You can't blame Iraq. You can blame people that don't realize um, you don't just catch rivers and then make it all better. You've got to think about the total quantity. You've got to think about the relationships. Now, can you go into Syria, Iraq, and Turkey and sit them down and say, we want to rearrange the way you're managing water? <laughs> Good luck. Let me know how it goes. I'm not signing up for it. Um, and there's discussions about this, and Jay told DOD. I didn't realize that until after he talked. But the problem with this conflict is water is not known to be part of the conflict to the public. If you ask the public, what's this battle about? Can we just send people back to Fallujah? Well, no, I got no water to drink now. Um, and so until that's up on the radar screen, until that conflict is known, well, let's, if we send over more guns, that might get better, these sorts of things. And these, these are issues are really complex, and so I don't mean to trivialize them as if they have more water, they do fine. But when you don't acknowledge it as a water issue, people try to find solutions, but it's really hard. Search the internet. If you look up Lake Tatar, you will see two things. You'll see military guys with fish, and you'll see a bunch of dead bodies. Um, but you won't see anybody talking about evaporation. But it's maybe one of the drivers that really influences the region. So if you look at a map, uh, there's the cotton production, four times higher. Here's the salinity increase, which coincides with some other thing. And um, it's not good. But nobody's talking about, hey, you might want to think about water management. There's another country called Egypt. And they're building a giant dam up in Ethiopia to fix their water problem. And do you think Egypt is going to become more stable due to that? But nobody talks about that. And it's uncomfortable for me to talk about things where I say the word Muslim, because right now saying the word Muslim on the news is pretty much crazy talk. But anything you talk about with data like these, 
and you go, this is really uncomfortable. So I actually made this slide to make you uncomfortable. Me, I wouldn't put up a slide like that. Um, but in terms of talking about water, if we don't talk about some of the data and some of the issues that are really confronting these things, people go, oh, it's a religious issue. Um, another location that's having an issue like this, they're turning off wells in Palestine. The Gaza Strip's one of the best doctors over there. And you go, we should fix this problem. Well, who's got water where? They don't have water, so who's got the water and where? And why doesn't the public know that? The public knows there's lots of religious issues. The public doesn't know that there's any water issues. And we don't communicate it as a community. Because it's really hard to stand on the news and talk about water in places that there are people killing each other. Um, California didn't quite get there. They got some movie stars in trouble, but they didn't quite get to killing each other. So um, you got to think about that. This is the best example of the world that water runs vertically through shales. That's coming through 800 meters of shale. So when they tell you shales don't leak, that's a spring coming from an aquifer 800 meters below the shale. Shales can leak. Um, they tend to leak at fault intersections. And right next to that set of springs is the world's largest uranium deposit, the fourth largest copper mine, the fifth largest gold mine by accident and default, with significant amounts of silver. I usually don't name company names, but it's the only mine out there. <laughs> uh, it's got about 1,500 permits, 1,500 contracts, about three th time of 3,000 they set up next to the springs. Uses groundwater from the Great Artesian Basin. This is the largest industrial user of groundwater in the Southern Hemisphere. In case you're on Jeopardy sometime and they ask you what the largest industrial use of water in the Southern Hemisphere is, now you know it's the Olympic Dam mine in Southern Australia. There's the Great Artesian Basin. This is four times the size of the Ogallala. Um, 40 to 50 percent of it is less than 1,000 milligrams per liter. That's potable for the U.S. The Australians don't care about that number because they're used to drinking worse. These springs are parked right next to there. And these guys, the economy of Australia is largely dependent on the mining industry. And if you want to run Australia, you're running on mine. And so the mining companies are a very, very powerful source. Those springs, you've got conflict. You've got one of your big economic engines for your country parked next to springs that are filled with endangered species. Out of these springs, that's the only set that's protected and studied. Their rainfall, they write it down on the gauge about once every 10 years. Typically, you'll spend an entire year without any precipitation. So this is your end member case of zero precipitation, groundwater system, but this is the most studied, the most invested in, one of the most vulnerable. These other springs are screwed up by a bunch of people raising cattle. And you don't want to put the cattle farmers out of business. Well, we need to spend millions to study this. Why? There's not enough conflict with the right thing. But here, where you've got the conflict and you've got a, a company that can quickly drain those springs out, they're mining at the rate that the springs will allow them to mine at. Um, so they could be done mining this place in about 50 years. They're going to take about 130. And they can still make money at it, so it's okay. But that conflict, in a case where there's zero precipitation, actually works quite well. But it's how do we as a community learn to communicate management of conflict um, deal with calls from a dean that says, you said what? <laughs> All those things, and that's tricky, tricky arenas for scientists. Um, but a lot of these problems are actually aided by conflict, or we get called during a conflict. And so we shouldn't necessarily think about the conflict as a bad thing. It's a driver to help the situation get some data to study it and to find a solution, so long as we provide an objective and provide options <coughs> as opposed to saying we think this is the right thing to do or the wrong thing to do. You can say, hey, if the country wants to drain out these springs, you can do that. If you want to do this and this, that would make those springs go dry and that would have these effects. But you don't say whether that's a good or bad thing. So our data and our instincts in water, uh, they don't necessarily align for the public at all. They don't necessarily align for you a lot. Um, depends on where you came out of and how you think about your instincts and whether you can beat them. Uh, but a focus on recharge, including power generation if you need. Um, and then 
makes some of the type of transpiration issues affect cropping prices. They still raise rice up in Arkansas and they go, we're out of water. You're raising rice. I know, we're out of water. There's a connection there. Um, yeah, but they can pay for their water. Yes, they can, um, but they've got to think about what they're evaporating. So, um, talking to lawyers, something you guys don't like to do. It's a useful thing. You don't have to necessarily tell them great scientific things. You tell them that lakes evaporate, and it's big news. And if you've got questions, let me know. Thank you very much, Doug.